Um, okay, today is hosted by Deakin University and API, the Arts Participation Incubator. When I first heard the, the acronym API, I got very, very excited because in the world I come from, API stands for Application Programming Interface, and it's a really hot thing. Yeah, that's us too. Yeah, and well, after today it might be. Um, so whilst I'm facilitating, I'm also going to be a little bit of a, a prov provocateur and talk a little bit about the sort of um, evaluation that I do uh, and the kind of projects I'm participating in. And one of those at the moment is this thing, HONEY. HONEY stands for the Humanities Network Infrastructure Project and it's a very large federally funded project designed to jailbreak Australia's cultural data. Uh, at the moment, uh, cultural data sets in Australia are collected by researchers and they're usually collected using different technologies, different formats, different methodologies of collection and so on and consequently they find it very hard to talk to each other as, as data. Um, and I suspect that's the same for most of you. Most of you will be doing evaluation, you'll be collecting information and sometimes data in digital form and you probably collect it in a format that's good for you but doesn't necessarily talk to other organisations um, maybe your funding agencies, but that's probably about it. Uh, that's very limiting in terms of what we can do uh, in, as, a, as a sector. And it limits the arguments we can make as a sector successfully to government, to the public, to ourselves. How do we engage with each other and let our data talk to each other is a question we're not asking at the moment. And it's not a simple question to ask, um, as this project will attest. This is taking 18 months to unite 28 data sets. And it requires an enormous amount of um, technical and organisational effort. Um, all good interoperability projects really operate at a series of levels. There's the organisational level, what we call the semantic level, so that we are actually all talking on the same page, and then the technical level. And the technical is in some ways the least difficult or problematic. It's the other two that really challenge. So that's, that's my first provocation, I guess, is I want you to think about um, uh, are the current ways we collect and account for performance data um, a disincentive for um, co-participation <laughs> as organisations? How are we actually participating together uh, in this effort? So that's number one provocation. Number two provocation. This one. <clears throat> Do we really, really think about participation as an aspect of our approach to evaluation? I don't think we do. I really fundamentally don't think we do because what we tend to do is collect information, data, survey forms, whatever we collect, and we keep it to ourselves. Do we actually share it with the people we've just evaluated? Do we let them have access to it? Do we let them reuse it or manipulate it? Almost never. I feel very strongly about this because this is a problem within the university sector as well. As researchers, we go off, we do research all the time, we turn it into jargon, we publish it in elite journals that cost enormous amounts of money to read, and usually can only be read by other academics, and we think we've succeeded. We haven't, okay? We clearly have missed a key aspect of why the public funds us to do research, and that is to engage with the communities we're actually researching. Uh, so I put this up as a, an exemplar of something that um, I've done. This is a project I did in, in conjunction with the Australian Film, Television and Radio School. We undertook a survey of all film producers in Australia. It was a huge undertaking because, firstly, we discovered there are a lot more film producers in Australia than we thought. We did a population survey based on a very quite rigorous methodology, and we came up with 4,650 producers in this country. Active producers. People actively making, producing films, or TV, or content of some kind. Um, so we surveyed that, that a sample, of, a fairly large sample of that population. And then when we had the data, we thought, well, what are we going to do with this? And we'll produce a white paper, we'll talk to people about the culture and production in Australia, we'll write some journal articles or whatever. What we did with it is we returned it to the community we surveyed. So we, we put this piece of software together. And what you can do with this piece of software is anyone can visit it, you can go along to that URL, and you can filter the data yourself and make your own inquiries of it without having to understand data it's and how to manipulate it. So I can just simply click on any of these things. Where do producers mainly work? They mainly work in Sydney and Melbourne, obviously, but I can then have a look at 
how that plays out by age. In Melbourne, they're younger. In Sydney, they're older. How does that play out by gender? There are more women producing in Sydney than in, in Melbourne. If I click on only Melbourne, all the data, you see that's 27% of the sample, the data changes accordingly. <coughs> Anyone can do this. You don't have to understand uh, SQL programming, MySQL. You can actually just come along and do what you would normally do on the web, which is click. And you can actually look at the data yourself and make your own interpretation of it. All the participants that we surveyed were sent this URL so that they could look at the data as well. Um, again, I feel very, very strongly about this, that if we are collecting material about the communities that we're surveying or that we're trying to evaluate, that we need to return that back to those communities so that they can see what we've done and that they can also use it themselves. So there are my two provocations for today. Um, we'll see how that pans out uh, through the panel as well. I'd be very interested to hear their thoughts on some of these things. Um, I guess um, my, my kind of last um, provocation is reserved for those people uh, who, um, uh, as, a, as a question of accountability, collect data about the arts and arts participation, and that's government agencies. Government agencies have been collecting data for donkey's yonks. Um, what do they do with it? A very interesting piece of data came out uh, two weeks ago. Screen Australia released um, a kind of state of the, the industry um, infogram, in, in, you know, what do you call them, informatics kind of illustration, like a big diagram telling all about the state of the industry. And one of the most inter interesting things on that diagram is this, this little piece of information. There are less women in creative roles in the film industry now, working now, than there were in the 1970s. Okay. There's a piece of information. What are they doing about that? Any thoughts? Yeah, that'd be nothing. Um, <clears throat> I can't tell you the number of times I've filled out forms where I've had to indicate whether or not I'm an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, which I don't mind filling out, but what I want to know is what are they doing to get more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders involved in the sectors that I'm currently being surveyed on? And I don't see that. I don't see the, the translation between the evaluation form and some kind of policy or action. Why? <clears throat> What's happened to all that data? For 30 years we've been collecting data on the film industry. I don't have access to any of it and I don't know who does. And that's where APIs come in, because an application programming interface would unleash all that data to the world. It's our data, we own it, we're the taxpayers, we pay for it to be collected. Most of it's not commercial in confidence. Why can't we have it? Okay. What is holding back the government from giving us that data? So that all of us, people who work in organisations, researchers, people who want to assess where they sit, in the broader scheme of things, can actually have access to the information we need. So that's my third and last and final provocation. Um, so on that note, I want to hand over to our first speaker, but I have to do some sneaky things with the computer first. Um, and I should introduce our first speaker. So everyone got the um, running sheet as well in front of them, so they know what's happening today. Cool. Okay, today's first speaker is Marcia Ferguson who's the Artistic Director of the Big West Festival. Um, she's also worked at Back to Back Theatre as an Artistic Associate and Freelance Director from 2000, curating and directing the community program and co-devising new works. She's won lots of awards. She's a great speaker, and she's going to be talking about some of the programs she's involved in at the moment. Um, and I'm just going to switch computers over. How are easy was that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Marcia Ferguson. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is um, just show you a few images of Big West Festival so you have a sense of um, who we are and what we do. So this is an image of uh, our opening event with a giant puppet created by Snuff Puppets, part of the Body Parts series. Um, and children loved a hand opening and closing and that there were different things inside each time they Okay, close. Here are some other images. Big West um, takes place in the western suburbs of Melbourne. We have an agenda to prioritise um, arts participation projects by communities who might face barriers to the arts. And these large scale um, open 
events that are free contain numerous artworks that are created by communities across the West. In general, these communities work with professional artists for quite a long period of time to develop these projects and then participate as performers. This is a, um, some examples of our 2011 program, our theatre program. In the top left hand corner is an image from Taxi, which was a work where um, people booked in to sit in the back of a taxi. Um, the taxi was driven by an actor and people and picked up uh, passengers, picked up clients. And the stories, uh, they're all actors, of course, except for the audience sitting in the back. Um, and the stories were created and contributed by taxi drivers who specialise in the West. And there were some amazing stories that fed that um, piece of work. In the top right hand corner is Boxman, which is a work created by Daniel Keane and Terry Yeboa. Um, and it was derived from um, a fairly tragic story about ex child soldiers who had come from Africa, arrived in Australia, and failed every integration program and slowly killing themselves with alcohol. Um, but also blotting out the past. In blotting out the past, they found a great kinship with ex Vietnamese soldiers. And these stories about that relationship. Um, and the kind of trauma that was leading to this slow decline created this play about a very resilient person, one of the people in that group. That's another image from Taxi Below and Terry um, in close up there. And that's an image from um, a previous festival directed by Karen Hadfield um, uh, of a ceremony, a river ceremony, very meditative piece with the Chinese community. Okay. Um, Big West elicits data through evaluations and surveys. These help us keep our program relevant to artists and communities, and they also serve as funding bodies' requirements for qualitative and quantitative evaluations. We need this data so that we remain eligible for funding that supports our program, and in particular, large scale events like this. As financial circumstances have tightened over 2012 to 13, all the criteria on the funding applications in government and non-government sectors are scrutinised more and more closely. So, you know, there's been an exponential increase in Arts Victoria applications, for example. So in order to choose the 10 out of the 300 applications, sometimes you have to look incredibly closely, more and more closely, at the responses that everybody has attributed across every area, and that includes evaluation process. A recent example of this is Arts Victoria's Organisations Investment Program, which is the new title for organisations funding. Um, in, through this program, um, it, was, it was beautifully set up and researched with great um, input from the industry to bring more developing organisations into that bracket. It offers triennial or one year, fund, it actually offers triennial funding for organisations to have core staffing, core rent, all those core costs. And as we all went through this process, we realised that um, only one in two organisations were going to be funded. So when this program started on the basis of accessibility, it has come to the point where it's actually also a way of weeding out um, expensive arts organisations. So organisations like Big West Festival are having to attend very closely to criteria that our funding bodies and our philanthropists are requiring of us. And I've given you some examples of these questions here. Um, for us, the really tricky ones are what will the social impact of the project be? What will the health benefits of the, of the project be? And that's for the long term as well as the short term. And what proportion of attendees are from communities of interest. So Big West's community of interest are, are very diverse. It's the called communities, the culturally and linguistically diverse communities. It's, um, Maribyrnong has the highest rate of mental illness in Australia. Um, uh, we have virtually no youth performance at all in the West. Uh, and also um, uh, called women. So we're interested in how we can support all of those communities and bring them together in fantastic intercultural projects. We're really good at getting qualitative data from our participants because 
I mean, one of the reasons is they're a captive audience. We're working with them, we're with them for six months. It's, it's not um, difficult to invite <coughs> feedback continuously through this process. And sometimes it's much easier to broach personal questions that might help us with some of this data. Um, so we both do very informal chats through processes. We also have a really formal process at the end that is a post-project evaluation. But the crew, the staff, the artists, everybody attends these projects and we ask them as a group to create recommendations for future planning. We record those evaluations verbatim and the actual words are used in um, our acquittals in our thinking, um, and they also begin to inform future projects. In my previous role at Back to Back Theatre as Artistic Associate, I worked a lot with community, and the artistic evaluations there were a really critical component of our innovative, uh, innovative programming. These evaluations sat at the core of the company's mission to create work around the central voice of the performance. Evaluations occurred continually through the process in a really informal way, hysterically funny most of the time, but also after each major gig. And this produces not only fantastic ownership of the work, but always spawned the next major work. We always had a sense of where this was going to lead on to. The actors' ideas at Back to Back and the community ideas in Big West do offer unique ways of seeing the world that can only be interpreted in innovative ways. If you really listen to the strong ideas from the community, they, they bend artistic form. They subvert the conventional expectations about what art is and what it can be. And if you follow it, you, you begin to get into this channel where the community voice is actually the leading instrument and explanation for why community practice is such a hothouse of innovation. The artist's role in this process is to bring their creativity to creating an artistic form that frames the development and presentation of the community's ideas. So you hear what people want to do, and then you have to find a way to make that happen. And that's how the, the process begins. So just talking briefly about um, Ganesh versus the Third Reich, which is Back to Back's um, last show. You know, there's a lot of conversation around what's this next show going to be, and there were two factions in the ensemble. One was the Rita Halabaric faction. Rita was obsessed with Ganesh, the elephant-headed Indian god and she was drawing pictures about this god. She'd done a huge amount of research about this god. She was fascinated by it. And on the other hand, I've been doing a community project with Theatre of Speed, which is the resident community group there, called DMI, Disability Maintenance Instrument, which was, ironically for this seminar, a form of um, evaluation of the level of disability of each individual in the ensemble that we employed. So there was like 360 different KPIs that we had to fill out on each actor in order for the um, department to analyse how much funding they would receive for us to support them. Um, so we went through all of this and in, in that research we discovered that IBM was the first organisation that developed number crunching for people with disabilities in the Nazi regime. Um, the, uh, IBM developed a, a statistical methodology for recording the number of people going to concentration camps. And this also led on to um, the incarceration and experimentation of people with disabilities in Austria. So we had the other part of the ensemble really interested in, in Nazism. And, you know, quite a few autistic experts who could tell you a lot about it. So in the end, Bruce Gladwin, who's the artistic director of Back to Back, just said to the filmmaker, could you just go and Google Ganesh and Nazi in one thing and see what we come up with? And so we did, and what came up was the swastika, which is Ganesh's symbol of optimism. And the Nazis, of course, appropriated that swastika, reversed it, and then used it as the symbol of their regime. So there was the narrative. After all, by really going ahead <laughs> and going through the whole process, we did, in fact, find a narrative of Ganesh, the Indian god, going into Nazi Germany, retrieving the swastika and bringing it back to restore balance in the world. Another um, example of evaluation feeding innovative process is a project called Dance Republic that has come out of four cultural groups that are working in the West currently. In 2011, four cultural dance groups, each one an indigenous dance group, decided to come together to have a cultural exchange. This was a really terrifying proposition because cultural dance is built entirely around law and protocol and it's, 
and, and, and that process is incredibly deep. So for them to come and say to each other, this is what this means, was really confronting. And in fact, bus, the bus bringing down the, the, the Maori group from Geelong decided in the car that they too couldn't go ahead with this and they would have to tell everybody they're terribly sorry that they're going to pull out. But when they got there, there was conversations, there was chats, the Dombai dancers stood up and started showing some stuff that they did and talking about these gestures. And quickly they realised that one of the hand gestures the Dombais used was shared in Indian dance and in Maori dance. And what did that mean? So they did work together. It was a profound relationship and they created an intercultural dance where all of those forms merged together into a celebration. And at the end, the audience clambered up on stage and started dancing with them. And they were shocked because it's not appropriate. It's actually not culturally appropriate for people to participate in the dance having, without permission. But they were also fully aware that people actually wanted to do this. And it was the first time that dawned on them. So they created this whole huge project that they were going to take, work with the Chinkareen people in Brim Bank, do this again, but make a bigger dance, and actually go out as teachers to all different aspects of the community and develop, um, develop this dance for a much broader range of people with a big tag at the end for audience participation. So, um, you know, clearly these forms of, of qualitative evaluation that lead to these new works are creative and they're constructive. They do underlie innovative projects, which might be innovative for their process, they might be innovative for their form, they might be innovative in terms of what is theatre. They offer time for reflection, time and space to reflect. They create community ownership of new work and they shape the plan and the program of festivals and art centres and companies. So that's very easy evaluation for Big West to do and back to back because we're small and we have that contact. Quantitative data is another kettle of fish. So my main concern here is how do we survey our large scale free outdoor events that I showed you in the slides right from the beginning. We, we really need to and want to demonstrate the number of attendees who face barriers to arts participation. We want to be able to quantify how many of those people have come along as audience members. We know how many are participating, but we don't know how many are coming as audience members. And it's really important for organisations who are driven by social justice to, to know how you're tracking. Anecdotally, it's really clear that Big West Festival and the other arts organisations in the West have created positive experiences, that they are inclusive, that they are ground-breaking in terms of cultural interface with, you know, what's essentially a, a white Western world of art, and that Big West has contributed to building a culture in the West. But anecdotal evidence is not enough, so how do we fulfil the requirements for quantitative data around the questions that I put up earlier? So using Big West as an example, our method has been to ask volunteers, who are wonderful, to approach and survey as many people as they can at these events. We have a survey that's two A4 pages long with about 20 questions. Now the sample size that they get to is quite small compared to our overall attendance of about 40,000 people. And it's predominantly focused on our community partnerships program, because that's our priority. But we, we don't have, we simply don't have the resources to survey larger samples or more comprehensively survey our other events, which are also intercultural events. So for your interest, we, we aim for about 100 people per community event. Um, and we do do online surveys, but we find we don't get a very good return rate at all through that. So what our volunteer-led survey processes give us is good data around audience size, the number of new visitors and repeat visitors to the festival, <coughs> how accessible people might have found the festival culturally, geographically or financially, or in terms of disability, and also just general demographic marketing information. So we are still concerned that our process will not remain robust enough to survive the funding climate. Is the sample representative? Is there an industry standard for representative sampling for outdoor performance events? Because I, I can't find is there a methodology for ascertaining, for example, how many attendees in the crowd have a disability or, are from, or regard themselves as culturally and linguistically diverse or are Indigenous or are experiencing poor health? 
And if you are doing it the way we do it, which is to hand out surveys and support people to fill it in, is that, is that really, you know, is that preserving the integrity of a random survey? A random survey is meant to be the most representative way of doing these things. So all the polls ring people up because it's random. But if <laughs> you've got somebody standing here going, I know Big West, you know, who do I go to? That person looks like they've got a disability, but I'll go and ask them. Or, you know, it's actually not authentic. It's not authentic. Um, we started talking about ideas like sticky notes that, you know, there's some huge chart on a wall, you know, who is the worst? And getting people to put sticky notes under, you know, are you culturally, linguistically diverse? Do you have a disability? Are you a, a woman? <laughs> um, but we have grave concerns about, um, about the effect or the extent to which surveying disrupts the artistic experience. You know, people are in the, having a great day, why would they want to go and dissect their identity. You know, we don't want to compromise um, the integrity and the privacy of people and their experience of artworks and events that are actually seeking to affirm a multivarious identity and just bring people together and forget about any of that. So we feel very uncomfortable about surveys that ask people to dissect their origins and their nature. Um, so we, we are in the position now where we feel as though the kind of surveying we need is actually a, a really scientific task and it requires specialised skills and it requires the employment of a researcher. But we are not in a position to resource that. Big West has two part-time staff for 75% of our two-year cycle. How can an organisation of our size furnish authentic figures for the data that are going to help us bring funding to sustain our arts practice in our community? If we don't do this rigorously, how will we succeed? In competitive times, many companies that I've spoken to are concerned with how authentic is this data collection anyway. Even though Big West has been using very standard pro approaches, we're not getting at some of these questions. When is a sample no longer representative? When do estimates become lies? How can we prove that we're accountable enough? So immediate options for us, if we want to start doing this work right now, on what we already have, is to actually move money out of core activities. We can cut staff, cut out days, and we can also try moving to cheaper accommodation that actually doesn't have a rehearsal space which is fully booked, a subsidised rehearsal, because there's no spaces in the West to do rehearsals. These options reduce our capacity to service the community, which is our reason for existing. So when faced with competing priorities like this, we have to weigh up whether to cut activity or cut research, which is like saying, another way of looking at this, do I want to grow an extra arm or do I want to grow an extra leg? That's how it feels. And we almost need someone like David Walsh to come and do some kind of, you know, crunching survey around the theory of probabilities to help us with questions like this. There's very high levels of disadvantage in Maribyrnong, Green Bay, Cobson's Bay, the Melton area of Wyndham. And new pressures are arising from fast demographic change in that area, such as the increasing movement of poorer communities to the outer reaches of the western suburbs, where fewer services exist. So just briefly, residents in Melbourne's west are born in 135 countries. They speak over 80 languages. 40% of our community was born overseas, and 43% speak a language other than English at home. These are very high statistics across <coughs> general demographic data. In the West, language is the key barrier, the cultural and economic barriers to arts participation um, are also profound. So it's a very important that cultural and arts organisations, we know the benefits that it has. It's very important that we convey accurate, authentic data around the value and benefits of our practice. We're also addressing how do we find methodologies that are not as intrusive as, are not too intrusive, are not intrusive. So, these are the kinds of survey practices that we certainly aren't aware of at Back to Back. Um, we're worried about conducting interviews or surveys in English when the survey subjects may not prefer English as their spoken or written language. Or in the case of people with disabilities, I can't tell you how many people come and interview the ensemble. And the ensemble don't understand the questions. 
asking um, and how long people spend with, you know, it's exhausting trying to answer complex questions if you don't have a good grasp of English. Um, additionally, there are cultural protocols. Vietnamese people prefer not to say no, they would prefer not to disappoint you. And if they don't want to, if they don't like something, they're really going to feel quite compromised. So you need to be very, very aware and very careful of these things. You don't ask an African elder if he enjoyed something. You ask him, what would you like to do next? You know, because the past is past and we're, we're moving on. We're, we're really uncomfortable about asking audiences to summarise their experience of an artwork or activity during the event or immediately after it. So straight after um, conversation at Malthouse, you know, there were two people going, would you feel like to fill that survey? And I, was, <laughs> I was very much in the world of that event and thinking about it. I, and when I looked at it, it was, how old are you? What's your phone number and your address? Do you, want to, do you want to donate? Do you want to buy a membership? Did you like it? You know, and it was really made me angry that the whole purpose of art, that there's constantly this line, that this drive for organisations to survive by collecting data, we're crossing our own lines. There's also a, a problem that white educated people, um, like myself, are, must approach and count New arrivals, refugees, culturally and linguistically diverse people, indigenous people, people with disability, you know, why, why aren't they counting me? I'm sure they do, you know, there are issues here. At first I believed that our organisation, Big West, was, was absolutely alone in lacking organisational capacity to conduct authentic <coughs> research because these questions are so generic, they're so consistent across so many funding bodies that, you know, to me it seemed natural to assume that everybody else could do it and that they were handing in these figures and it was quite easy. But as I did begin to speak with people from other organisations and companies, many of them share the same difficulties. And indeed most of them say, well, what, what the hell are you doing anyway? You can't verify these things. It's no point, it's just a game. So, you know, if Big West, for example, was to survey participants or audience members in the coming festival about how does this, you know, how does this impact on your life and so on, how it happened, addressing some kind of KPIs under social impact, if I was going to go back to those people in three years' time and say, you know that show that you did with Big West, what kind of impact, enduring impact has that had on your life? You know, I'm not feeling really great. You know, so such as such, you know, I'm not yeah, it was good at the time, but, you know, just a show. What then? Do I say, well, is that because you, you had a divorce in the interim? Or how do we quantify the thread and the vein of art through these lives? It's not possible. But, and, and then what does that data really mean to the people who are collecting it? I'm also concerned from the perspective of the West that if you're assessing social impact, you have to look at economic impact. You have to do an economic analysis because in the West we have areas of, you know, geographic areas where people are earning less than $26,000 a year. A lot of people. So how can you do, how can you do a social impact survey around art if, if you're not doing an economic analysis and obviously we're not resourced to do that. These are all the questions that I'm hoping this forum might be able to help answer. <laughs> In, in my search for all these helpful tips and tricks, an academic said to me, Marcia, nobody has, nobody has the resources to do it. No one. And, you know, call me naive, and I am a naive person, but I was really taken aback. So here's those funding criteria again. If that's true, that no one can authentically measure these indicators, then who is being funded? Is it only organisations who've crossed a funding threshold like councils or art, health or, or research? I don't know. People who have departments that undertake this kind of reporting that can afford to fund this kind of research? Because, you know, I'm really interested to kind of vox pop this and I'm sure there will be a survey today to get more information out of all of your heads. But if you can all just think of a project or any project, just think of a project, if your organisation can answer the question, describe the social impact of your project, 
right now, could you raise your hand? Could you think of a project? If your organisation can answer, describe the social impact of your project, please raise your hand now. Now raise your hand. <laughs> Nobody. If you're a council worker, if you work for a council, could you stand up? Thank you. Okay. If you can afford to employ or supply with the services of a researcher in the last 12 months, could you raise your hand? Yeah, gee, that's fascinating. Thank you. And if you are an arts worker, could you stand up? And if you can afford or supply for the services of a researcher in the last 12 months, could you raise your hand? Yeah, right, God. Okay, thanks. So, that kind of sends my next point a little bit cool. <laughs> but I was going to say if that if organisations are funded to do this kind of work, then there is an economic advantage, there is some kind of discriminatory thing happening. Really, none of us can, really. The other thing that is discriminatory or potentially discriminatory about these processes and these questions is that we know that good wording you know, has an impact on applications. We know that people with English as their second language are going to struggle. In fact, I help a lot of people who struggle to write funding applications because they're quite confident about their English. And the only way that they could really do it is to write it in their own language. Um, but OSCO is the only organisation that will translate and they generally, so far, have kept that just to letters of support. So there are precedents for discrimination in this process um, that are really hard to resolve and have to be considered. In times of economic restraint and greater competition for arts funding, is there a danger that big fish might eat little fish? For example, how much longer can the Ethiopian festival in Maribyrnong continue to make their festival of $2,000? How will Tessify Gahana, one of Ethiopia's most famous actors, directors and playwrights, produce and fund his play that he can only write in Ethiopia? How much longer can small to medium companies competing for funding in increasingly straightened times fund their programs if they can't do this research? Writing that Arts Victoria's community partnerships budget, which many of us have depended on, has reduced by more than 50% since 2011. So if the academic who said to me that no one can provide this data is right, why do these funding criteria endure? Because someone has to be getting it right. Or, or we're faking it. So as my search for helpful tips and tricks continued, some solutions began to materialise. suggested budgeting for research fees and applications. Um, the Big Health Partnership Doc, as I have been told and I've looked at it, could be a really great tool for measuring success. There's fantastic research that's been done by Big Health in particular and also OSCO. So there's a, a document, what's the social impact document called again, Jim? Social uh, the participation in the arts? Yes, yes. Social participation, oh, that's a fabulous um, piece of research. And also OSCO's um, More Than Bums on Seats um, is, is great. It does talk about what stops people from getting, um, from participating in the arts. Arts Victoria have an evaluation framework, which I find a bit difficult, but um, it's there. And it's been suggested that you can adapt existing models of evaluation. Personally, I find that again very difficult to do because we, I don't know if every organisation is unique and finds it hard. Tricky, and you can apply for capacity um, funding, building your capacity to do this kind of stuff, which, which we've just begun to, to try to. <clears throat> now, in terms of um, the first one, budgeting for research fees and applications, I do know of an arts organisation that does budget for research fees in all their applications, but the quandary for us and, and our community members, like Testify, is that when funding's so tight, and the project really costs $32,000, but they're, only, they're going for a grant that's capped at $20,000. If they give $2,000 of that to a researcher, then that's a significant percentage. 
And, it, and it's interesting, it just doesn't make sense to testify that when his lead artists would take a pay cut to enable research to happen without, compared to losing rehearsal time. So they'll take a pay cut so that they can still have the researcher but keep the same amount of rehearsal. In addition, $2,000 might stretch to assessing immediate or short-term benefits, but it, it won't answer the question about long-term benefits. So, and also along the way, I realised that talking to other arts companies to help me with this... Oh, that was my cue. That was your cue. Yeah. Oh, can I finish? I was being a little subtle. Sorry. I'm Just doing an evaluation. Oh. Is that right? Mm. I'll leave you speak quickly. Okay. Other arts companies <laughs> don't necessarily like sharing their tips and tricks because their own survival depends on the research that they have done and invested in. So, thank goodness for the help and this code at Arts Victoria. Um, In, I'm just going to sum up, sum up with this, that um, I, I think gathering data is really important because there's clearly, when you see the traditional dance that the Rhythm Evolution people created, there is no representative, a representation on our stages or our screens of cultural dance. Our cultural dance world is non-existent and Bangara is a fantastic example of that, how you can make art using other dance forms than white the dance forms that are you know, familiar to our white community. So to me it's really important that we're all gathering statistics and putting them together as Devin suggested, to go, you know, what the hell? Um, how, many, how many artists are being supported? Cultural artists are being supported. We need to know that to, to create actually a democrat, democrat, democratic representation. So lastly, this is my wish list. We seek methodologies that are culturally sensitive, they're ready to go, they meet funding criteria, they can be delivered by us, our two part-time staff, or our volunteers, they provide authentic data, and they do assess the quality of our work and its benefits. And most of all, we hope that wish list will enable us to continue to create amazing art and imaginative domains that do not need Thanks, Marcia. If anyone hasn't got a seat, there's plenty of seats down the centre of the room if anyone would like to move down. And also, um, you'd be closer to the speakers then. <laughs> Alright. Um, uh, we're going to hold questions till the end of the speakers. Uh, but of course, I've got the microphone so I get to say whatever I like. Um, and I want to thank Marcia for, I thought, a very thoughtful assessment of what the impact of evaluation itself is on a, a company. Um, and you know we've all had those experiences of of getting very tiny amounts of money and being expected to be so accountable for you know the two thousand dollar grant or the five thousand dollar grant that you spend the entire amount employing someone simply to equip grant um, and that's pointless. Um, so we have to create evaluation mechanisms that are actually sensitive to the the and scalable to the amounts of money that are actually being doled out as well. I think that's sort of a key takeaway for me. From from what you're describing. Um, but I do kind of want to, again, put a provocation out, which is that um, clearly for many um, arts companies that are uh, built around participation is one of their key uh, reasons to exist. Demographic data is very important, and that's uh, a kind of key to evaluating your performance. In the commercial sector, where, where a lot of research is now being done on the new ways in which audiences engage and participate in content, demographics are not important at all, and they're becoming less so. Um, and there, in fact, um, it, there's a big, uh, I guess, battle going on at the moment between conventional ways of surveying audience behaviour built around uh, ratings, uh, which are all demographically based. So Nielsen and companies like that are, are trying to adjust to a new technology environment. And new forms of, and new methodologies of evaluation that have uh, led most researchers to believe that, in fact, demographics are now no longer critical to understanding audience behaviour. So this is, a, this is an interesting spot for the arts, because the arts still need or want information about demographics, and yet the new, t new methodologies and technologies for gathering information aren't based around demographics anymore. So I'll just leave that one with you. Um, 
Our next speaker is Dr. Lachlan McDowell, and uh, Lachlan is doing a really interesting project at the moment called Spectres of Evaluation, which is funded by the Australian Research Council, and is essentially, I think, an evaluation of evaluation, if, if we can get really meta <laughs> and postmodern. Welcome, Lachlan. And I think Marcy's given a great introduction. She's foreshadowed some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, I work in a centre called the Centre for Cultural Partnerships at the University of Melbourne, which is a centre that looks at community-based arts projects. And we've been doing arts evaluation for nearly 10 years, where often the academics that people come to saying, what do we do, what do we do? So we've worked with the um, Australian Council, and we've worked with Jim and Big Health, and we've worked with... Uh, Arts Victoria and a range of small and medium organisations um, providing advice about their evaluations. We also have a teaching program um, that runs a master's program at up to PhD level, and as part of that, we also teach our students about how to do evaluation and how to conduct research. So we've had graduates and students are here today, so they're out there doing some really um, interesting work. And it's the kind of creative work of students, I think, who are really in situ, who's starting to provide some of the things that are on last year's um, wish list. So I just have in mind a student who worked with, um, she was working in music therapy with uh, women from Port of Africa communities, federally funded. The program was, had a, a mandated evaluation structure that involved surveys um, that were inappropriate for a range of reasons. Um, and she developed another methodology based on kind of narrative evaluation. And not only did that work with the group that she was working with, but she also convinced um, the federal program to roll out that evaluation Australian way. So there are examples of being creative and working within the, the constraints of um, these projects. I'm going to talk quite negatively about evaluation, so I'm going to build a, a more critical kind of framework on some of the reservations um, and contradictions that Marcia has identified. Um, I think having a critical perspective on evaluation initially makes evaluation seem harder, but I think eventually a critical perspective um, starts to make evaluation a little bit easier for reasons that I'll explain. I'm going to basically make five points about why evaluation is such a trial and a problem. Firstly, uh, no one really knows exactly what we mean by evaluation. Secondly, there's a range of intrinsic problems with arts evaluation. Thirdly, evaluation is inevitably connected to ideas of value and to debates around cultural value, and these are necessarily political debates. Fourthly, um, evaluation in the arts is part of a broader trend of intensification of cultural measurement more broadly, and that um, presents a range of other kind of problems. And the final thing I want to talk about is just to talk about this question of methods versus methodologies, because I think there's a big difference between a method and a methodology. And many people who want to do evaluation, their immediate question is, what's the tool? Uh, tell me the next kind of method that I can use. Like, what's the method? Um, and methods are a small part of the issue. What we need to think about is a broader methodology for doing the work. Uh, because, to quote a wise person, to a uh, hammer, every problem looks like a nail, um, there's a tendency for methods to create value, to create audiences, to create the value that they're trying to measure. So I think we need to get out of a uh, fixation of your immediate kind of toolkit, step back and think critically about evaluation. But firstly, two very brief and light-hearted anecdotes about my relationship with audiences and audience um, research. So my partner's a, a stand-up comedian, and um, this has meant that I've spent a lot of time in comedy clubs, and I've often been the guy on the door that takes your money, um, takes your five bucks as you come in to see the show. So part of my non-research uh, relationship with audiences is watching these people come through the door and taking their money, which is a really nice, direct kind of thing to do at comedy clubs. For the first two or three years of my supporting my partner in her comedy, I could say hi to everyone at the door because they're all our friends just coming to the gigs to support. <laughs> and then there was a crucial day when people started to show up that I didn't know who they were. And in comedy, we call these people hunters. They're just people who've decided to come to the show for reasons that are not about personal kind of affiliation. 
So now the, the punters stream through the door, I don't really know who they are. And I, I take their money and it's no longer $5, it's a little bit more. But one of the things about comedy and evaluation, of course, is that comedy has an inbuilt evaluation function that's extremely immediate and extremely <laughs> effective and decisive and provides a, a kind of feedback loop um, that lets you know whether you are doing something that's good or not good. And it happens in an instant. And it doesn't matter what kind of surveys or how much money you take at the door, comedians will tell you um, that they've done well or they haven't, and the audience will let them know if they are. If they haven't done well, the, the guys will come off stage and blame the audience, and the women will come off stage and blame themselves. <laughs> my other really interesting for me encounter with audiences was in my own academic research. So I do arts evaluation, but I have a range of other research kind of interests, particularly around graffiti and street art. But my PhD thesis was on um, sexuality and terrorism in popular culture. And you know, very oblique and niche kind of topic. But I, I, I did publish a couple of early pieces, and this was in the early 2000s when academics were encouraged to put their work on the internet. So I put my work on a, um, a repository on my university's page. Um, one of the things that happens when you do that is you can start to get statistics about who's reading your work, who's downloading your, your work. And I was really thrilled to see, firstly, that anyone was caring enough to read the work, but eventually, my, uh, one of my first articles on historicizing bisexuality started to, to garner quite a lot of internet kind of interest, you know, relatively speaking, for academics. <laughs> but one of the things that first struck me when I got on the oh, you know, 80 people in the first month have downloaded this article, when I broke it down by country, um, nearly half of those people were from the uh, Republic of Iran. And this had a tremendous effect on me because I realized, firstly, that there were people out there reading my work, but also there were people out there um, who could probably get in a lot of trouble for reading my work. And it also really challenged me to think about the fact that in a lot of our theorizing, we, we tend to think about a, a dominant kind of Western um, context. So I don't know if this was some kind of computer glitch or some kind of hacker or some real interest in the work from Iran, but it didn't really matter to me because it made me think about this imagined and imaginary audience um, in a kind of feedback loop that's similar to stand-up comedy, um, and that changed the way I started to think about my subject matter. So there's, there's value in thinking about audiences, um, but the nature of our, our current ARC project is really thinking about the, some of the problems of evaluation. And I think one of the, the main contributions that we might make from this research is trying to define a little bit more clearly about what the problems are, and there are a number of them. Um, I will finish with some more positive kind of news and, and talk to you about some of the other types of valuations that we're currently trialling with um, organisations. But I'll just quickly run through what I think are some of the problems um, and encourage you to, to take this kind of critical approach to evaluation, which has already been um, strongly uh, outlined in Marcia's um, presentation. So when people say evaluation, they mean actually a range of different things. Some people aren't clear what they mean. Some people mean one thing, and evaluation actually takes in a range of um, practices. So in our field, in terms of thinking about community-based art, evaluation um, used to be about thinking about things like best practice. You're talking with people like, how did you think that project went? What did we do well? What could we do better? Etc. But evaluation um, more recently has tended to be a bit more rigorous. It's tended to be about an external and objective assessment of what's going on in the project. So it needs to be data that's kind of verifiable and needs to be quantifiable. But evaluation, I think, can also mean at a slightly harder end, thinking about opportunities for people in projects to provide negative feedback and, and negative value. Um, and this is tricky because as, as Marcy has indicated, it, it's quite uncomfortable to say that you don't like things. So one of the questions that we often ask about evaluation frameworks is, do they provide opportunities for people to safely, maybe even anonymously, provide negative kind of feedback? Um, I'm about to take over the head of a research center at the university, and every time I read the, the newspaper, I, I swing to the back and read about the Essendon Football Club <laughs> and their problems with governance, because I think um, the Essendon Football Club is a really interesting example of issues around governance and evaluation has a relationship to that question in relation to, question of, to questions of negative value. 
So evaluation can be about learning about what we did well, it can be about advocacy, but maybe it also needs to be an opportunity to think about um, when things didn't go well, kind of a safety net, uh, an alert system. Um, and for that to happen, it needs to be, to some extent, arm's length, so that people are free and comfortable. Communities who want the programs are free and comfortable to provide negative feedback um, and still get the, the programs next year. There's a range of other problems with um, arts evaluation, and, and particularly in community settings, and that is that a lot of art activity, a lot of community-based art, sets out to contest singular and predefined <coughs> notions of value. So communities aren't interested in a, a predefined notion of value. They want an art that's experimental, and they want something that's going to be multiple and plural. And evaluations tend to um, either predefine the outcomes or kind of shut down some of those questions. We've heard about some of the range of technical problems about collecting data, um, which I won't go into further. There's also, of course, in, in the cultural sphere, activities are, are complex. People are complex. They unfold. Activities unfold in, in non-linear ways. And we're always dealing with this you know, classic philosophical problem of human beings being both the objects of research, but also active subjects. So, you know, we're not like frogs and buildings and numbers. We, we know that we're being researched and we respond to, to that fact. So it's a complex, um, complex system that we're thinking about. Many projects are cross-funded. So this idea of cross-sectoral funding between arts and non-arts agencies is now kind of ubiquitous. So this brings, of course, divergent assumptions about success and also divergent measures around um, how success will be measured. And finally, I think that the arts are often talked about in evaluation in very abstract kind of ways, even calling them the arts. There's no the arts. There's lots of different types of making art. So, you know, photography is like an entirely different activity to, say, stand-up comedy. I'm the quiet introvert who likes photography. My partner's the crazy extrovert who likes uh, comedy. And the processes behind both these things are very, very different. We can't bundle them together as the arts. And this is no more um, evident than in a, uh, an anecdote which many of you have heard before around some data collected by a project called Community Indicators Victoria that worked with local government to collect data. So they collect data about all sorts of things. They have some really interesting questions about um, social inclusion. So one of their questions is, um, could you raise $2,000 in 24 hours? It's a standardized question that's designed to capture how connected people feel to their communities. They also ask about what kind of arts people do. And interestingly, if you, if you cross-reference all of the data, you find that all art forms make people happy. Going to dance, being a dancer, going to theater, all art forms make people happy, except one. And that is creative writing, which <laughs> makes people more miserable. <laughs> but of course, that's not the value of creative writing. Writing, being introspective, spending time by yourself, it's not about being happy. Um, and it's a great example of the fact that the, the arts tend to be thought about in abstract ways. We need to think more clearly about the different um, experiences, the differences within the arts. So evaluation has within it a question about value. Um, and there's been a range of debates, particularly in the UK, over the last decade around this question of cultural value. And these have intensified in the context of the global financial crisis, where financial systems seem to be a preeminent, pre kind of out of control form of value. So in many um, parts of Europe, they are rethinking this question about cultural value because there's actually not a lot of economic value left in those um, communities. <laughs> So some of the uh, attacks in the art, on the arts in the UK, these uh, modes of austerity, have raised this question around cultural value. And I think the most important point to make around cultural value is it reminds us that no matter what technical operation we come up with to capture and evaluate, behind it is a question of value. And in the UK, evaluation has been used to try to depoliticize debates about value. Um, so this is been a, a, a kind of common thread in the UK governments, whether it's the Labour Party or the, or the Tories, to think about um, bureaucratic processes that would capture value as a way of not, have to, not having to have debates about that broader kind of value. But as my colleague um, Eleonora Belfiore, who's done a lot of work on the social impact of the arts, argues, we, we cannot use 
technical measures in substitute for political debates. The politics is there whether you like it or not. Arts evaluation is not alone. So it's not just Marcio's having some trouble and it's not just other arts organisations. We, we live in an era of intensification of measurement in all its forms. Some of these are benign, some of them are extremely dangerous. Um, and it feels like we're, we've already had the debate about whether we should do evaluation. It feels like we, we know evaluation is positive and arts participation is positive, so what's the problem? But there are a range of views that, that argue that we should be contesting these questions of measurement, not just what we measure, but even that we measure. And this is not easy to do, and not everyone's in a position to make those debates. But the, the classic account of this is comes from a woman named Arlene Goldbar um, in the States, big advocate of arts advocate and community-based arts kind of worker who, who basically just says, just say no to metrics. So she talks about some of the dangers of incorporating forms of measurement, particularly measurement from other disciplines, from the social sciences, which is a big bugbear for her, um, in taking that into the arts. So I think we do need to think critically about maybe contesting some of those modes of measurement. And finally, the distinction between methods and methodology. So um, a colleague of mine in the, in the UK, Sophie Hope, has written a couple of books, the titles of which I think are really important. The first is around, is called Participating in the Wrong Way, which is a kind of critical account of arts and participation. So she's working in a similar space to um, the art critic Claire Bishop, who basically argues that we, we cannot simply think of participation as a positive force. We need to think about the way arts participation is framed in relation to broader political landscapes. So she says, you know, under Labour in the UK, arts participation was all about social inclusion. And now when you think about under a conservative government, participation's being framed under David Cameron's big society as a type of volunteerism. There's a, there's a kind of um, um, bringing forward of this idea that participation is a good, but it's not a good that we should be paid for. That it's a kind of, uh, uh, something that we all should be doing, but that's part of a broader political kind of idea. So the problem with tools, and thinking about only about tools, is that individual tools create their own forms of value, um, and we need to be more strategic about having a broader kind of methodology around how we, um, how we do our evaluation. So I really think it is about kind of customization. I mean, it's that question that Marcia kind of came to at the end of her talk about thinking about what's going to work for your organization. So I think you need to be critical. I think you need to be also creative and think about how arts themselves are forms of evaluation or could be tools that work in that sense. In our project, we're investigating four areas at the moment, and it's the last year of the project that we're working with four um, arts organisations across Australia. Um, and we're thinking about um, these four ideas. We're thinking about questions of harm and negative value and how they could be part of an evaluation. We're thinking about aesthetics and ideas of beauty and how they can form part of an evaluation, particularly because there's a lot of um, recent writing that's reframing this idea of aesthetics in a more engaged kind of way. Um, and following up the work of my colleague Marty Bannon, we're thinking about democratised kind of measurements. So from a, a community-based perspective, um, doing some of the things that Deb's talked about and Marcy has mentioned of engaging the community more directly, not as objects of the research, but as active researchers themselves. So there's some excellent work from um, Yilan Wadsworth around um, action-based research and do-it-yourself social research. I think her book, Do-it-yourself social research, is, is still like still sells like 5,000 copies a year. It's an amazing book. So democratizing the, the, the tools for research, seizing the means of production, as it were. And finally, we're thinking about um, network th thinking and network theory um, as it relates to some of these questions around data. So a lot of organizations already have very strong online activities, which immediately produce um, plenty of data. My final bits of advice are very simple to think about talking to people who have expertise in this area. Um, so have conversations with academics. Um, and also think about triangulation, which is a very powerful, simple idea that says you need to have different types of data, different methods for investigating the same thing so that you can check that those methods are actually working. So to triangulate data, you would maybe have um, some quantitative data, some qualitative data, and some other form of data. And of course, the most interesting thing in, in triangulation is not when all the data tells you the same thing. The most interesting thing is when 
one of those data, forms of data tells you something that's wildly divergent from the other, because then you know that those measures are actually creating their own kind of value. You've got some kind of contradiction. It's also an opportunity to think further about the, about the problem. So, you know, I hate to be a downer, but um, it's really complicated and it's also really political. And we live in an era of intense, um, intensifying modes of measurement, which is also about intensifying modes of, of governing. And we are a heavily governed society and also you know, forms of arts and culture are increasingly um, implicated in that. And um, that's, just the, that's just the water that we swim in. 